Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Fearless Floyd Show. As always, I am your host, Fearless Floyd. Today is November 24th, 2023, the day after Thanksgiving. And as you see behind me, the U.S. total debt. The current U.S. debt clock reads roughly $33 trillion, 700, I think it's $33 billion, something like that change. I'll show you in a minute. But that's not the true debt. I'm going to break this down to you, and I'm going to show you that the real debt, conservatively, is really $51 trillion. Absolutely. When you see it, you'll get it. So we're going to run through this, and uh, I'm going to, you know, as bad as I am at math, uh, we're going to walk through this together and we're going to do the math. And I'm going to show you where these numbers come from. And it's going to be an eye opener. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not an attorney. Uh, I'm not a medical practitioner. So I don't give advice for any of those. This is 100% for your entertainment purposes only. You're free to choose to do whatever you decide to do. With the information that I provide, that's my free waiver. Because what I'm about to disclose is going to be pretty shocking, pretty scary to you. You'll get it when I'm done. So stay tuned while I'm over here getting things ready on the share screen. Why don't y'all like, subscribe, share, hit that notification bell, leave a comment below. The Fearless Floyd Show at yahoo.com is my uh, email address, fearlessfloydshow.com, is the web store, the website. You can go to the store in there. Uh, got all kind of holiday specials going on. So if you want to get Anne LaFleur's On Trust ebook or the soft cover book or both, you want to get in some classes, A class, uh, there you go. Go to the store, please. Uh, if, you, if you want to set up a trust in 48 hours, we got that happening over there as well. The Fearless Floyd Show across every social media platform you're probably going to interact with. I may not be uh, a participant, but I do have a placeholder in there, so I am there. All right. Uh, I am currently on the FDIC's website. And they're celebrating their 90th anniversary. Imagine that. And basically a historical timeline, and this just breaks it down. Here's the first 50 years. And, uh, you know, basically the FDIC was created right here. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC, is an independent agency created by the Congress to maintain stability and public confidence in nation's financial, in the nation's financial system. The FDIC insures deposits, examines and supervises financial institutions for safety, soundness, and consumer protection makes large and complex financial institutions resolvable and manages receiverships. So we're gonna learn more. I'm gonna click here. And just to make sure that it did share, I'm gonna stop the share and reshare like I always do because sometimes Zoom does not carry over. So uh, basically same thing, what we just read. All right, well, let's find out what the FDIC really does. The mission of the FDIC is to maintain stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system. In support of this goal, the FDIC insures deposits, examines and supervises financial institutions for safety and soundness and consumer protection, works to make large and complex financial institutions resolvable and manages receiverships, which I already discussed. An independent agency of the federal government now, <clears throat> remember that, an independent agency of the federal government, right? USA Inc., the FDIC was created in 1933 in response to the thousands of bank failures that occurred in the 1920s and early 1930s. Okay, this is from probably from the, uh, the Banking Act. The FDIC receives no congressional appropriations. It is funded by premiums that banks and savings institutions pay for deposit insurance coverage. 
the FDIC insures trillions of dollars of deposits in U.S. banks and thrifts, deposits in virtually every bank and savings association in the country. Deposit insurance. The standard insurance amount is $250,000 per depositor per insured bank for each account ownership category. Since the start of the FDIC insurance on January 1st, 1934, no depositor has lost a penny of insured funds as a result of a failure. The FDIC's electronic deposit insurance estimator can help you determine if you have an adequate if you have adequate deposit insurance for your accounts. The FDIC insures deposits only. It does not insure securities, mutual funds, or other similar types of investments that banks and thrift institutions may offer. Learn more about deposit insurance here at this link. Supervision and examination. And I'm going into this for a reason because we're gonna get into this a little bit more into this video. Supervision and examination, and you folks should know this. You should, uh, you know, hopefully this video will put it all together for you so you don't have to go to seven different places to get all this information. I've done it for you in one place. Supervision and examination. The FDIC directly supervises and examines more than 5,000 banks and savings associations for operational safety and soundness. Banks can be chartered by the states or by the Office of the Comptroller of Currency. Banks chartered by states also have the choice of whether to join the Federal Reserve System. The FDIC is primarily, primary is, sorry, start over. The FDIC is the primary federal regulator of banks that are chartered by the states that do not join the Federal Reserve System. In addition, the FDIC is the backup supervisor for the remaining insured banks and savings associations. The FDIC also examines banks for compliance with consumer protection laws, including the Fair Credit Billing Act, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Truth in Lending Act, and the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, to name a few. Apparently, there are more. Finally, the FDIC examines banks for compliance with the Community Reinvestment Act, which requires banks to help meet the credit needs of the communities they were chartered to serve. Resolutions. To protect insured depositors, the FDIC responds immediately when a bank or a savings association fails. Institutions generally are closed by their chartering authority, the state regulator or the Office of Comptroller of, Currents, of the Currency. The FDIC has several options for resolving institution failures, but the most common is to sell the deposits and loans of the failed institution to another institution. Customers of the failed institution automatically become customers of the assuming institution. Most of the time, the transition is seamless from the customer's point of view. Where we are, the FDIC is headquartered in Washington, D.C. and has established regional and field offices around the country. Who we are, the FDIC is managed by a five-person board of directors that includes the Comptroller of Currency and the Director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, all of whom are appointed by the President of the United States and confirmed by the United States Senate, with no more than three being from the same political party. For more information about FDIC's mission and operations, please be sure to browse the additional information offered in the About section of this website. Thank you for your interest in the FDIC. Well, you're more than welcome. So now you kind of get a gist of what the FDIC is all about, right? Okay, so you heard about all that little supervision and responsibility they have over these 5,000 U.S. banks, correct? All right, we're going to get into that in a minute. Let me go over here to the next um, tab and get that cranked up for you guys. I wish they had some kind of seamless PowerPoint thing you could do, set up, but um, that's something else. All right, as you see, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation definition and limits. And this is from March 14th, 2023 by Julia Kagan, reviewed by Summer Anderson. This is from investopedia.com. Knock that out of the way. All right. Uh, basically, parroting the same thing. Well, 
key takeaways. The FDIC is an independent federal agency insuring deposits in U.S. banks and thrifts in the event of bank failures. The FDIC insures deposits up to $250,000 per depositor as long as the institution is a member firm. The FDIC covers checking and savings accounts, certificates of deposits, CDs, money market accounts, IRAs, revocable and irrevocable trust accounts, and employee benefit plans. Mutual funds, annuities, life insurance policies, stocks, and bonds are not covered by the FDIC. Okay, I wanted to address that. That's why I jumped over here. The primary purpose of the FDIC is to, quote, prevent, or sorry, is to prevent, quote, run on bank, close quote, scenarios, which devastated many banks during the Great Depression. For example, with the threat of the closure of a bank, small groups of worried customers rushed to withdraw their money in those years. Right. And that was a staged event. If you've done your history research or historical research, understanding the FDIC, this basically breaks it down, you know, tells you what's covered, wah, 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 how to file a claim. Special considerations, we already know what it stands for, we already know why it was created, we already know what's covered, boom, bottom line, $250,000. However, if you have a trust, one trust per one account, per one beneficiary, $1.25 million in FDIC research, or insurance, sorry. All right, let me move on to the next tab. Here we go. This is actually from treasury.gov. See right here in the browser. This is an official U.S. government website. Fiscal data. What is the national debt? The national debt is the total amount of outstanding borrowing by the U.S. federal government accumulated over the nation's history. Well, this is currently what we owe. Thirty-three trillion seven hundred sixty-six billion four hundred eighteen million nine hundred fifty-five thousand six hundred fourteen dollars and no cents. Absolutely no cents. <laughs> so I wanted to show you this. Key takeaways. The national debt is composed of distinct types of debt, similar to an individual whose debt may consist of a mortgage, car loan, and credit cards. The different types of debt include non-marketable or marketable securities, and whether it is debt held by the public or debt held by the government itself, known as intragovernmental. The U.S. has carried debt since its inception. Debts incurred during the American Revolutionary War amounted to 75 million, primarily borrowed from domestic investors and the French government for war materials. National debt enables the federal government to pay for important programs and services for the American public. National debt explained. The national debt is the amount of money the federal government has borrowed to cover the outstanding balance of expenses incurred over time. In a given fiscal year, when spending uh, exceeds revenue, a budget deficit results. To pay for this deficit, the federal government borrows money by selling marketable securities such as treasury bonds, bills, and notes, floating rate notes, and treasury inflation protected securities, TIPS. The national debt is the accumulation of this borrowing along with associated interest owed to the investors who purchase these securities. As the federal government experiences reoccurring deficits, which is common, the national debt grows. Simply put, the national debt is similar to a person using a credit card for purchases and not paying off the full balance each month. The cost of purchases exceeding the amount paid off represents a deficit, while accumulated deficits over time represents a person's overall debt. There's a little brief uh, a visual for you guys to kind of explain it to you if you do not get it. Uh, so here, we're going to go into some funding programs and services. So just, you know, where that money's going, I guess. Federal government needs to borrow money to pay its bills when its ongoing spending activities and investments cannot be funded by the federal revenues alone. 
Decreases in federal revenues are largely due to either a decrease in tax rates or individuals or corporations making less money. National debt enables the federal government to pay for important programs and services, even if it does not have the funds immediately available, often due to a decrease in revenue. Decreases in federal revenue coupled with increased governmental spending further increases the deficit. Consistent with the purpose of federal government established by the U.S. Constitution, money is spent on programs and services to ensure the well-being of U.S. residents. The Constitution's preamble states that the purpose of the federal government is, and I quote, to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, close quote. Uninterrupted funding of programs and services is critical to residents' health, welfare, and security. Well, it sounds like to me somebody didn't get this memo in Congress in the Treasury because we're not getting ours. So anyway, uh, the growing national debt. <clears throat> this is a very important paragraph right here. If you don't want me to read it at all, um, here's a graph for those who uh, are um, don't want to listen. You'd rather look and see. That's from $35 trillion right there. All right. <laughs> and this will tell you by year. You can go right here. Okay. That's 2012, 2013, 2014, 15, 16. What happened in 2016? That's when Trump was president and he inherited $25 trillion in debt. Well, let's see what he did in his four years. Okay, so he went from 24.94 trillion. So we're just going to round it off 25. First, next year, he uh, only added a uh, 240 billion to the debt, which is remarkable. The next year, it went up to, so he added 1.22 trillion to the debt in two years, three years. He added 2.22. And then in his final year, of course, you see it ballooning. Uh, it went up to 31.85. So 6.85 in the last year. And how this remains flat, I have no idea. We've been sending hundreds of billions. To, uh, well, you see, it just went from 2021, it was you know almost 32 trillion, and now it's 33, so a trillion in one year. So basically from 2021, we've put, yeah two years. Well, anyway, I already read that. The growing national debt. The U.S. has carried debt since its, incept since its inception. Debts incurred during the American Revolutionary War amounted to only 75 million by January 1st, 1791. Over the next 45 years, the debt continued to grow until 1835 when it notably shrank due to the sale of federally owned lands and cuts to the federal budget. Shortly thereafter, an economic depression caused the debt to again grow into the millions. The debt grew over 4,000% through the course of the American Civil War, increasing from 65 million in 1860 to 1 billion in 1863 and around 2.7 billion shortly after the conclusion of the war in 1865. The debt grew steadily into the 20th century and was roughly $22 billion after the country financed its involvement in World War I. Notable recent events triggered large spikes in the debt, include the Afghanistan and Iraq wars, the 2008 Great Recession, and the COVID-19 pandemic. From fiscal year 2019 to fiscal year 2021, spending increased by about 50%, largely due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Tax cuts, stimulus programs, increased government spending, and de decreased tax revenues caused by widespread unemployment 
generally account for sharp rises in the national debt. Comparing a country's debt to its gross domestic product, GDP, reveals the country's ability to pay down its debt. This ratio is considered a better indicator of a country's fiscal situation than just the national debt number because it shows the burden of debt relative to the country's total, total economic output and therefore its ability to repay it. The U.S. debt to GDP ratio surpassed 100% in 2013 when both debt and GDP were approximately $16.7 trillion, which means uh, we're not even paying interest. We're not paying the principal. I don't even think we can afford the interest. So we've uh, we've gone over the hump. We're in a free fall, which y'all don't really understand. Uh, let's see. Breaking down the debt, the national debt is composed of distinct types of debt. Similar to an individual whose debt consists of a mortgage, car loan, or credit cards, the national debt can be broken down by whether or not, whether it is non-marketable or marketable, and whether it is debt held by the public or debt held by the government itself, known as intergovernmental, which we already covered. The national debt does not include debts carried by the state and local governments, such as debt used to pay state-funded programs, nor does it include debts carried by individuals such as personal credit card debt or mortgages. The visual below comparing the calendar year 2013 and 2023 displays the difference in growth between debt held by the public and intergovernmental debt. While both types of debt combine to make up the national debt, they have increased by different amounts in the past several years. One of the main causes of the jump in public debt can be attributed to increased in funding of programs and services during the COVID-19 pandemic. Intergovernmental debt has not increased by quite as much since it is primarily composed of debt owed on agencies' excess revenue invested in the Treasury. The revenue of the largest investor in Treasury Securities and Social Security Administration has not increased significantly in recent years, resulting in this slower intergovernmental holding increase. All right, so white, purple, lavender color, lilac, whatever you want to call it, those are intergovernmental holdings. This is debt held by the public. So you can see this is a, uh, you know, 200% increase right here. This one's, uh, you know, not quite the same, but still. But definitely the public are incurring more debt. That's growing at a greater pace, which is worrisome. Because these are the people that are funding these people, right? Isn't that how they get their money? Fines, fees, taxes. That's how uh, corporate governmental entities survive. Absolutely. So as we scroll down here, the interest rate and total debt. See, I guess the interest rate that we're paying, debt ceiling, we know what that is. That's established by Congress that, you know, hey, we're not going to spend over X amount of dollars this year, but, you know, somehow they end up giving themselves raises. Yeah, taking vacations during crises. It's, yeah, this country's, I don't know, I, you know, it would take me a while to describe it. Tracking the debt, diving deeper into the debt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Rather go to bed without dinner than rise in debt. Benjamin Franklin, statesman, civic leader, and diplomat. There you go. That's, that's sage advice there. I have to give him on that. So let me stop here, go back over here, and make sure that I am in the next one. All right. So I was like, well, um, Let's see. So the FDIC is the one who, you know, watches all the banks, make sure that they're solvent, sound, you know, gives them those tests, right? Well, what does the Federal Reserve Bank do? What do we need them for? Well, I asked that question. Well, here's the answer. 
over the past decade. Let me see. All right, here, I'll just read it straight from the Federal Reserve.gov. The Federal Reserve, the central bank of the United States, provides the nation with a safe, flexible, and stable monetary and financial system. Really? Council on Foreign Relations. So let's just. All right. Stop share. Sorry. No, it sucks. I know. Oh, yeah, there we go. All right. This is actually, you know, federalreserve.gov. There you are. Right? Even though it's a .gov, what don't you see on this page? What don't you see on this page? Please, somebody tell me. Anybody? Anybody? It's an official governmental website with the little flag on it. Don't see that anywhere, do you? This is an independent agency. <laughs> we'll get into that. What is the purpose of the Federal Reserve System? Federal Reserve System, often referred to as the Federal Reserve or simply the Fed, is the central bank of the United States. It was created by the Congress to provide the nation with a safer, more flexible, and more stable monetary and financial system. Didn't that sound like the FDIC that was created in 1933? Hmm. Federal Reserve was created on December 23rd, 1913 when President Woodrow Wilson signed the Federal Reserve Act into law. Today, the Federal Reserve's responsibility fall into four general areas. Those are conducting the nation's monetary policy by influencing money and credit conditions in the economy in pursuit of the full employment and stable prices. Supervising and regulating banks and other important financial institutions to ensure the safety and soundness of the nation's banking and financial system and to protect the credit rights of consumers. Maintaining the stability of the financial system and containing systematic risk that may arise in financial markets. Providing certain financial services to the U.S. government, U.S. financial institutions, and foreign official institutions, and playing a major role in operating and overseeing the nation's payment systems. Hold on, Jim. Jim, hold on here, bro. Whoa, where'd you go? Come back here. Listen, come here. Come here. Primary purpose of the FDIC is to prevent a run on bank scenarios, which devastated many banks during the Great Depression. Right? And it told us up here what they did. Key takeaways. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation is an independent federal agency insuring deposits in the U.S. banks and thrifts in the event of bank failures. The FDIC insures the deposit of $250,000. The FDIC also covers checking, savings accounts, certificate deposits, money market accounts, IRAs, revocable, revocable trust, and employment benefit plans. It does not cover mutual funds, annuities, life insurance, policy, stocks, bonds, et cetera. But the FDIC was created in 1933 to maintain public confidence and encourage stability in the financial system through promotion of sound banking practices. And we went through what those were, right? Did we not? What we do, insurance deposit, examines and supervises financial institutions for safety and soundness and consumer protection, works to make large and complex financial institutions resolvable and manages the receiverships, right? Isn't that what they said? Federal Reserve, conducting the nation's monetary policy by influencing money and credit conditions in the economy and pursuit of full employment and stable prices. Supervising and regulating banks and other important financial institutions to ensure the safety and soundness of the nation's banking and financial system and protect the credit rights of consumers. Maintaining the stability of the financial system and containing systematic risks that may arise 
in financial markets, providing certain financial services to U.S. government, U.S. financial institutions, and foreign official institutions, and playing a major role in operating and overseeing the nation's payment systems. It sounds like they do the exact same thing, except one has a little bit more authority than the other. And guess which one it is. Oh, we're going to stop screen share. Now I'm going to go over here. And we're going to tab up the next one. And. All oh, this was lined up yesterday. No, sorry. Yes. Oh, I answered the wrong question. I'm sorry, I had it right here. Laid out. I'm just going to scroll up and show it to you. Go in there, though. Oh, baby girl, what can I do for you? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, oh, no. Man. You do. You search. Ah, here it is. Dang. Would you hang on for a minute? I'm shooting a video, please. Please. If you're here begging for more uh, egg yolks, you ain't gonna get them because I'm out. I told you I was out. No, they're all gone. I'm not kidding. All right, sorry about that. Okay, who owns the Federal Reserve Bank? Federal Reserve Bank is not owned by anyone. It consists of a federal agency called the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., and 12 privately chartered regional banks nationwide. The Board of Governors has direct oversight over the regional reserve banks and coordinates with the presidents of the reserve banks on monetary policy. Federal Reserve law requires national banks to be members of the Federal Reserve system and to own a specific, specified amount of, of the stock of the Federal Reserve Bank in the Federal Reserve District where they are located. The real control of the Federal Reserve Bank still resides with the Rothschild family. Yeah, you're reading it right there. And this is from, um, that's a zero, right? The zero, that's Donald Watkins. Who's Donald Watkins? Rothschild's controlling the world's money supply for more than two centuries. Copyrighted, published. Uh, the Rothschilds have been the world for more than two centuries. Yet most never heard of them. Oh, we, we already know all about them. I care not who makes the laws as long as I control the money. That dude said that. 
<laughs> and it's probably going to have his quote in here somewhere. Ah, here it is. Ah. Uh, Nathan Meyer, Rothschild Controlled Bank of England, bully declared, I care not what puppet is placed upon the throne of England to rule the empire on which the sun never sets. The man who controls Britain's money supply controls the British Empire, and I control the British money supply. There you go. So I was paraphrasing. Nathan, I'm sorry, that wasn't Meyer. I said it was. It was Nathan, not Meyer. I was correct. It is uh, Nathan Meyer, not uh, Amschel. Mayor Amschel. And they all, it, the, the Rothschilds intermarry. They marry their uh, nieces and nephews. So they keep the money in the family. Absolutely. And usually they drop a generation. So it would, yeah. Yeah, their nieces and nephews. Yeah. That's what's going on with that. So it looks like we have a little redundancy. Who's really controlling the money supply? Is it? The Rothschild family via the, the Federal Reserve Bank, Central Bank of the United States? Or is it the FDIC? Or is the FDIC just kind of this like, mm, not going to say imaginary because it, it exists, but uh, kind of like a, a ghost institution? It's there, you know, they claim to do some stuff, but why should they do it when the Federal Reserve's doing the same dang thing? Unless they're doing it for double accounting. Blind side accounting, that would be the only thing I could think of. But, you know, you know, you, you know, nobody wants to audit the books with the United States government. <laughs> nobody wants that to happen. Uh, okay. Uh, next. Now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of the whole video. Now we're getting into numbers because numbers don't lie. Only liars lie. Here we go. This is Wallet Hub. Uh, just you know, picked it out. It's from Adam McCann, Wallet Hub Finance Writer, September 6th, 2023. All right. And I got this because, you know, bank industry market share is important to consumers and investors alike. On the one hand, understanding which banks and credit unions do the most business will help guide your search for the right credit card, prepaid card, checking account, etc. Not only can the biggest banks typically afford to offer the best deals, but they're popular for a reason and you can use the comparison shopping that other consumers have already done to make your search more efficient. On the other hand, banks with a heavy deposit base typically dominate the lending space, while those with significant assets may garner higher valuations. Table of contents, market share of U.S. banks by domestic deposits, market share of U.S. banks by assets. First, U.S. market share of U.S. banks by domestic deposits. Here you go. J.P. Morgan Chase, which of course, has the, the lion's share, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, we've got Citibank, uh, U.S. Bank National Association, uh, Truist Bank, PNC, TD Bank, Charles Schwab Bank, Capital One, Goldman Sachs, the Bank of New York Mellon, uh, State Street Bank and Trust Company, Fifth Third Bank, HSBC Bank, and the rest. All right. Now, there's a reason I did that. Okay. Because of this. Top 15 banks make up almost three quarters of the deposits for all U.S. banks. Top 15 largest U.S. banks based on, based on total domestic deposits. Okay. These are the numbers from 2022 total deposits in billions. Right here, JP Morgan Chase is 2.12846 trillion. Okay. Bank of America, 1.9 trillion. Wells Fargo, 1.4 trillion. Citibank, 0.76 trillion or 763 billion, US Bank 455 billion, PNC Bank 446 billion, Truist Bank 435 billion, 
Charles Schwab, three eighty nine billion. TD Bank, three fifty six billion. Goldman Sachs, three forty three billion. Capital One, three thirteen. The Bank of New York Mellon, two hundred thirteen billion. Morgan Stanley, one eighty two billion. Citizens Bank, one eighty one billion. Silicon Valley Bank, SVB, which is is bankrupt, one seventy four billion. So that one went under. So don't think the big ones. There's no such thing as too big to fail. All right. Top five institutions make up more than half of the total bank assets. So let's get into the real numbers, right? What all the banks have. So this is the top 50 largest banks and thrifts in the U.S. based on total assets. Okay. This is their market share. And this is their total assets. So I have 3.3 trillion, 2.5, 1.6, 1.7. Uh, 564 billion, 552, 529, 434, 381, 424, blah, 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 all the way down. I'm not going to go through all 50. Some of these are, are not available. You're looking at 17 trillion, 298 billion. Okay. For the top 50 in total domestic assets deposited in U.S. banks. That number right here behind me, 17 trillion 298 billion. What is this number? That's our that's the current deficit. This is deposits held by the national banks. This money is insured by this bankrupt company that is negative 33.7 trillion. So when you take those two liabilities and add them up, because if the banks fail, where are they going to go get $17 trillion from when they already owe the world $33.7 trillion when that comes to roughly $51 trillion? You understand how banks work. You understand fractional banking. So this would be I got to save this for you guys. So as we were uh, talking about this with the deficit, 51 trillion, you guys need to real some, realize something. That's real money right there. That's, that's a real figure. In order to have this and this, they had to print this. Sad to say what they're showing you folks banks create money out of thin air it's called the fractional banking system that's from modern money mechanics published by the chicago federal reserve this book and it has oddly enough Zimbabwe dollars on here. <clears throat> Could be a clue. As you see, uh, look, originally published by the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. And this will tell you everything how the financial system really works. You can also go read The Creature from Jekyll Island, The High Priest of Treason. Either one of those books will also educate you how the financial system really works. Now, let's get into the next thing. Because if you think that's scary, get ready for this.
De-dollarization. I've mentioned this before. De-dollarization. Countries seeking alternatives to the U.S. dollar. Currently, the Federal Reserve note, the U.S. dollar, has been the world's reserve currency. Everybody has bought, sold, and traded all kind of commerce in U.S. dollars. The United States, being the bully that it is, has used the Federal Reserve note, U.S. dollar, as a weapon, financial weapon to break down these companies, to make them submit. They're done. They're tired of it. They're not going to have it anymore, especially with this current administration we have that, you know, they don't have any respect for Joe Biden or Obama, who's really running things. Hey, Barack and Mike. Yeah, give Mike a, give Mike a hand job. I mean, shake for me. Dear dollarization, country seeking alternatives to the U.S. dollar. This is from... Uh, uh, Bruno Vendetti, published eight months ago, March 31st, 2023, graphics and design by Sabrina Lamb. This is from uh, visualcapitalist.com. The article, pick one at random, understanding de-dollarization. The U.S. dollar has dominated global trade and capital flows for decades. However, many nations are looking for alternatives to the greenback to reduce their dependence on the U.S. De-dollarization. The process of substituting the U.S. dollar as the currency used for trading commodities and other goods and services. Timeline of dollar dominance. 1920. The dollar began its, to displace the pound sterling as the international reserve currency after the First World War. The United States is a significant recipient of wartime gold inflows. 1944. International trade is conducted using the U.S. dollar under the Bretton Woods Agreement. We recently had a Bretton Woods II Agreement. 1971, President Nixon ceases the direct convertibility of U.S. dollars to gold, took us off the gold standard. 1960s, European and Japanese exports become more competitive with U.S. exports. There's a large supply of dollars around the world, making it difficult to back dollars with gold. Absolutely. When you start printing more than you have assets, that's where we're at, folks. You see, they've they've been doing this for, you know, 60 years now, 1981, after years of hyperinflation, the U.S. dollar loses two-thirds of its purchasing power. All right, 1981, here it is, a years of hyperinflation. Did you hear that? Years of hyperinflation. What do you think we're going through now? This is hyperinflation, folks. This isn't inflation. This is hyperinflation. You're seeing prices rise before your eyes. What used to, you went down to your local grocery store, you spent 20 bucks. Now you walk out of there, you know, 40, 50, 60, 80, man, you're all butthurt going, damn, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. <clears throat> yeah, that hurt. Uh, 2004, 2008, global financial crisis. Investors seek U.S. dollars, expecting the currency to retain its value. Okay. This is when that funny money got out there and uh, was extremely over leveraged. And uh, uh, approved to way too easily, and this is where all those uh, mortgages for you know your uh, your yard guy who pulled up in a beat up pickup truck, pulled out a lawnmower and weed eater, and did your yard for cash money, and they sold him a you know three or four hundred thousand dollar house because he could sign his name. That's what happened then. Twenty fourteen, following the annexation of Crimea. Russia prioritizes de-dollarization in response to Western sanctions. See, they've been doing it since 2014. They have a head start. They have their own CBD currency. The ruble is already uh, asset backed by gold. Absolutely. Um, you know, when I say I'm rooting for Putin, I'm rooting for Putin. Sorry. If you don't like it, beat it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because Putin's doing the right thing, believe it or not. If, uh, if I was Russian, man, I'd be rooting for Putin because, Hey, he's standing up for Russia, right? You don't see those people going nuts over there. You don't see Muslims in the street. You don't see the Jews in the streets. You don't see any strife, no Black Lives Matter, no Antifa. None of these idiots running around, no open borders. He, Putin can actually have a conversation intelligently. Unlike our current president, Joe, go blow your brains out, Biden, allegedly. 
maybe, probably should. Not a threat. I'm just entertainment purposes only. 2023, uh, Brazil and Argentina. I just thought what that would look like. I had a visual. I can imagine, uh, you know, Joe Biden. <clears throat> Probably execute the dog commander. I did it. I did it. I killed myself. <laughs> uh, wouldn't that be great? Uh, 20, 2023. Brazil and Argentina discussed the creation of a common currency. UAE, United Arab Emirates, and India explore the use of rupees to trade non-oil commodities. Russia and Iran are working together to launch a cryptocurrency backed by gold. Despite these movements, expect, few expect to see the end of the dollar's global sovereign status anytime soon. Currently, central banks still hold about 60% of their foreign exchange reserves in dollars. Here's the world's foreign exchange reserves. You see the big dominance we have. All these countries over here, they're starting to shed this these U.S. dollars. They can't just like, you know, take all their pallets of U.S. currency and load them in a plane or a truck and, and send them off, okay? They have to slowly incorporate those and accumulate other currencies that they have an agreement with that country to exchange in their own local native currency. So before, um, let's just hear, here's Japan. Uh, before Japan needs, you know, they're, they're upside down too. They're in trouble. Uh, but before they start liquidating all their U.S. Uh, assets, uh, you know, and they want to trade it for um, Mexican pesos. Okay. They have to have an agreement with Mexico. Hey. You know, we want we're going to get rid of these uh, these U.S. Treasuries, you know, and that's what we've been using to trade. So uh, we're going to start accumulating Mexican pesos from other countries, so we can use it to trade with you, and that way we can trade our currencies back and forth. Okay, we'll give you pesos for yen. Fair enough. Yeah. Boom. That deal's done. That's what they're talking about up here, where these countries are working together. Okay. And that's what I'm going to get into next is BRICS. Okay. So here's all the stats. 2022, central banks uh, buy gold at the fastest pace since 1967 as countries diversify their reserves away from the dollar. The war in Ukraine results in Western sanctions against Russia. As a result, Russia and China deepen cooperation between their financial systems with ruble yuan trading, increasing 80 times in eight months. Okay? They are ganging up on the United States, folks. And guess what? The United States government is going to be okay. It's going to survive. Guess who's not? Us. If you're not prepared, you don't understand what's going on. And this tidal wave hits. You've seen what a monsoon does. I mean, uh, what a tidal wave does to a community, a beach community. Wipes it clean. That's how hard you're going to be hit. You're going to be left standing there with empty pockets, no money. Banks are closed. ATMs are closed. Cash only. No debit cards, no credit cards. What's that look like? Are you ready? Are you ready for that? If you're not ready for that, then you are not prepared. You're going to get caught hands down, pants down, and uh, you know, you're going to have to give away everything to survive if that occurs. What I'm showing you is the facts that at any minute, that one card, that one toothpick, that one domino. That one linchpin can trigger, and the domino effect cannot be stopped. Once it once it starts, it's going to be very, very, very ugly. They are doing every day. Uh, all these countries are doing everything they can to keep the dollar propped up because they cannot afford to lose the for the dollar to collapse as well. You see what they're invested right there. There's, man, I don't know how many hundreds of trillions of 
printed Federal Reserve notes out there in circulation. Okay. I, I just counted 51 trillion. All comes back to be worthless. Dollarizations, country seeking alternatives to US dollar. This was originally posted on Elements. US dollar has dominated global trade and capital flows over many decades. However, many nations are looking for alternatives to the greenback to reduce their dependence on the United States. This, this graphic catalogs the rise of the US dollar as the dominant international reserve currency. In the recent efforts by various nations to de-dollarize and reduce their dependence on the U.S. financial system. Okay, and this just goes into it and into it and into it. And I'm going to dive over here and I'm going to introduce you to BRICS. If you've never, uh, if you don't know what BRICS is, BRICS. BRICS is an intergovernmental organization comprising Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, hence the acronym BRICS. It was formed in 2010 by the addition of South Africa to its predecessor called BRIC. In, 20, in August 2023, at the 15th BRICS Summit, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa announced that Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates had been invited to join the organization. Full membership is scheduled to take effect on the 1st of January, 2024, which is in a mere five weeks. A lot of things are going to happen January 1st, 2024. Iraq will be completely de-dollarized. It will be illegal to transact with the U.S. dollar in Iraq. Absolutely. Currently, the BRICS nations encompass about 27% of the world's land surface and 42% of the global population. Brazil, Russia, India, and China are among the world's 10 largest countries by population, area, and GDP. All five states are members of the G20 with a combined nominal GDP of 28 trillion US, about 27% of the gross world product, a total GDP of around $57 trillion, 33% of the global GDP, and an estimated $4.5 trillion U.S. in combined foreign reserves as of 2018. The BRICS were originally identified for the purpose of highlighting investment opportunities and had not been a formal intergovernmental organization. Since 2009, they have increasingly formed into a more cohesive geopolitical block with their governments meeting annually at formal summits and coordinating multilateral policies. Bilateral relations among BRICS are conducted mainly on the basis of non-interference, equality, <clears throat> and mutual benefit. So they had a, um, a symposium in uh, June, mid-June, uh, in St. Petersburg, Russia, Putin uh, hosted. And uh, then they had a recent one in mid-August, right here, uh, in South Africa, Johannesburg. Uh, they all met. And um, that's when some new members were incorporated. Um, they... It, they uh, clearly, they already have their currency printed. Let me see if they have a picture of it here. No, they don't. Um, let me see if I can find it. Because if not, I have a picture of it. Um, Grab that for you guys. You can see it. Of course, I think it's slow. Oh, 
You know, you'll die before you even get close to counting to a trillion. There you go, folks. There's your BRICS 100 note. All the countries. Under. They already have currency printed, ready to go into circulation, that they're going to trade between their countries. When you start seeing those in the United States, we're in trouble. I mean, big trouble. <clears throat> All right. So I've covered that. Now, um, this is my opinion, my opinion only. If you have large sums of money, and any one of the banks might want to think about investing it in something a little bit more stable than the bank and have it on your person. Just saying. Uh, me personally, I don't trust banks. They are uh, liars and thieves, lawbreakers. Um, don't operate by the law. They operate by bank policy. Absolutely. Um, it's real crazy. I'll go in and talk to these bank managers and I talk circles around them. They don't even know that they operate under the Texas Business and Commerce Code. I know. It's so strange. <laughs> Do you understand what uh, type of money mechanics you operate under? You ever heard of modern money mechanics? No. Fractional banking? No. Yeah, it's sad. Uh, those are the people managing your money. Yeah. The smart ones, they work for the bank. They're making the bank money, not making you money. Making the bank money. Absolutely. So I want to close with this last little bit. Um, you know, putting your money in a bank is like putting your money in a bankrupt institution because the banks are bankrupt. They're, just, they're ready to pop. They're barely surviving. Uh, people are making less money. People are having to spend more money. When they spend more money, there's no money in their accounts, which means the bank doesn't have any deposits. They don't have any deposits. They don't have any money. They're bankrupt. They're upside down. Think about it. Just do the math. When you do the math, you see what's coming. It's just, I, I, they have to prolong this as long as they can. They cannot let the U.S. dollar, the Federal Reserve note, collapse. They do, the world economy will collapse at one time. Every country. The world will be in chaos. Absolutely. Way too big to fail. So everybody's trying to even the playing field, diversify. You know, maybe we shouldn't be sitting on 70%, 80% US dollars in our central bank. Maybe we might get some of that and, you know, get rid of. 30% of it and use that to buy gold or silver or platinum, palladium or oil for our strategic oil reserves, a commodity, right? And just keep whittling that down to where it's something yeah, more reasonable that you can absorb if there is a collapse of the dollar, like maybe, you know, 10 to 20%, as long as you have, you know, a, uh, 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 a sound, reasonable um, asset portfolio in your central bank, oil, gas, um, precious metals, precious gemstones, um, heavy metals, all this stuff, you know, natural resources, assets. But, um, you know, you definitely want to, don't want to throw, you know, if, if you... <laughs> If you're going to a store and it said going out of business, 
would you actually put something on layaway and expect it to be there in six months when you have the money to come back and get it? <laughs> Might be a warning side, right? A red flag. Red flags there. Let me show you what these freaking clowns are doing. I read this and I was like, wow, wow. These are some greedy son of a bitches. Okay. All right. AIG Financial Products Corporation, United States. This is from uh, 2008 with the financial meltdown. 37.7 billion founded in 1919. Almost made it 100 years. AIG, American International Group, is a multinational finance and insurance corporation with a presence in more than 80 countries. In 2008, its financial products unit almost destroyed its parent company and the entire global economy with it. Okay, It's finance, financial products unit. You might recall how the financial crisis unfolded. Some of the biggest names in finance made bets on derivatives backed by subprime mortgages, as in made to borrowers with poor credit, as described earlier. Uh, those would be derivatives, mortgage-backed securities. Where have we heard that before? Boom. And when the borrowers defaulted, the value of these securities plummeted, dragging the institutions that booked these bets down with them. Long story short, the Federal Reserve intervened and bailed out AIG to the tune of $182.3 billion to prevent an even worse crisis. And of course, they sold that off, right? Okay. AIG's financial products division was virtually shut down shortly after, but it kept existing on paper with no employees of its own and just a small portfolio of financial products. On December 12th, 2022, the shutdown became official with the parent firm taking a loss on the remaining $37 billion intercompany debt. The infamous AIGFP financial products, file for Chapter 11 as the first step to permanently ceasing operations. Game over at last. Maybe not. Some of the units, former executives have moved to throw out the bankruptcy case. They claim that AIG is looking to avoid paying up to $640 million owed to them in wages, bonuses, and other forms of compensation for fucking destroying the company and almost taking down a 90-year-old institution. Oh, yeah, hold on. Let's just throw out everything just for you guys because you destroyed everything and we're going to really take care of you for that. You greedy asshole bastards. Unbelievable. I couldn't believe it when I read that. I was just blown away. Whoever these people are in these financial products and you're still begging for money for something that you drove into the ground, you knew was a bad investment, but you yet you did it anyway and put the world's economy at risk and you want to be compensated for it. That's what I got for you. <laughs> yeah. No, guys, sorry, idiots. But anyway, there you have it, folks. Laid out the factual facts. I can't make it any clearer. The banks are insolvent. The United States is insolvent. We are $51 trillion in freaking debt. That doesn't include the mortgages. That doesn't include the student debt loan. Why do you think they forgave that? They wrote that shit off. It's, like, it's just as pieces of paper. <laughs> credit that made it go away didn't it right it's gone I don't see any evidence of debt we just shredded it it's that simple that's how they created it let me get your signature here come on hurry go now where do they get wise where they figure out their signature is the money Allegedly. Entertainment purposes only. I'm not a financial advisor. But there you have it, folks. There's your total U.S. debt.
And I would say with the student, I'm not even going to look it up. Student loans, mortgages, credit card debt, I guarantee you that's $100 trillion. You know, it takes over 30,000 years, years to equal 1 trillion seconds. So if you started counting now, if you live to be 100, you'd have to live over 30,000 times to count to a trillion. 30,000 lifetimes. You'd still be counting. Like, let's see, where was I last last time? Uh, 1,162,485. 1 million, right? 86, 87, 88. Yeah, you see what that looks like? Well, that they're printing money like that. They're spending it like that. So with all that money, imagine what that looks like coming home. I already showed you guys that picture. Here, let me, let me go show you that picture. Get back over here to my, my Facebook where I have this stuff. I'll post it for you guys so you can see it. Yeah, you're all going to trip out on this guy. Not the brisket. The beef rib. There he is. Oh, hey, hey. Muhammad. Slow down, bro. Ready? Load is up. We here. All right. These are hundred dollar bills. Which are looking at right here. These are hundred dollar bills. Okay. Those are wrapped in cellophane. He's fixing to kick through all this, and I want y'all to look at this footwear. What he's wearing. Okay. See all these? Those are just stacks of fucking hundred dollar bills. All these. This was a pallet. This was a fucking pallet of hundred dollar bills. Watch. See those stacks right there? All cellophane, wrapped up, straight, straight from the U.S. Treasury to the Middle East on C-130. Nothing about that. That freaky? I used to have a shoebox like that. <laughs> about big as I got with my little spread. <laughs> I didn't have a whole freaking room with stacks of it still wrapped in freaking plastic. Really? That's what we did. That's what we dumped over in the Middle East in the last two decades. Since the Iraq war, absolutely. And the Afghanistan war. Yeah, they just fly pallets of that shit over there. And they give it to these goat herdsmen. And they they look at these this stack of, what is this, uh, start a fire with it? Bro, there ain't no gas stations around here. There ain't no stop and go, 7-Elevens, Circle Ks. There ain't no Walmart, Target, <laughs> Roger. Safeway. There ain't nothing, bro. I need some goats. You give me some goats. They come in handy. They give me milk, food, sex, uh, uh, companionship. Companionship, milk, food. There we go. Yeah, goats. So they're over there giving these herdsmen Stacks of money that they don't know what to do with. They're starting fires with it. That's about all they can use it for. Toilet paper. That's it. We sit tons of it over there. Tons of it. Y'all see what's happening. Please be prepared. 
it can get real scary real quick. I don't know how many of y'all have been through a hurricane and a disaster, but it'd be worse than that. And with that, like, subscribe, share, hit that notification bell. Leave a comment below. Ask me a question. Email me at thefearlessfloydshow at yahoo.com. Fearlessfloydshow.com, my website. If you'd like to take uh, advantage of some of our holiday specials, go to the store at thefearlessfloydshow.com. I am the Fearless Flow Show across every platform that you can probably participate on social media. Mainly, I'm over on Telegram. So go find me over there. Thank you for watching this video. Y'all have happy holidays. Until I see y'all again, be prepared. Can we get a little peace in the Middle East for the holiday season? Thank you.